good news, we're not talking about small cell zoning. <laughs> Bad news. <laughs> what are we talking about? DAS, small cells, in building, enterprise. So um, we've got uh, four panelists today. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions. Um, uh, the uh, chairman of the FCC told me earlier, uh, since he loves CTIA, loves that show, somewhat biased, he will pay $10 for every question get asked today. Checks in the mail. Okay. okay. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to ask each of the uh, panelists. So uh, Ronnie Halswick, uh, oh, Ronnie's out there. I think most of you know. Uh, Ish Kandasamy? Yes. That's yep. Right. From Comscope. Uh, Ish came all the way from Singapore for this panel. And he's flying straight back. Is that right? Almost. Almost. Yeah. Uh, Bob Butchko and Ken Sunfeld on the end. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, who they are, what they do. And then the question I'm going to ask them as they, uh, as they introduce themselves is, um, what's, what's the biggest change been? We'll start with you, Ken, by the way, just to let you know. Uh, what's the biggest change we've seen in the enterprise DAS market in the last 12 to 18 months? And the, the kind of precursor to this question is, you know, AT&T used to do a lot of funding, <laughs> and now they do less. <laughs> um, so what impact has that really had on the industry and the market, especially for the enterprise space, and how have you seen it shift? So, well, er everything goes in cycles. Uh, you know, so uh, I got into in-building 15 years ago, and uh, we sold directly to the enterprise, and we asked them to pay for things. And then all of a sudden, the carriers wanted to pay for things. And uh, now they don't want to pay for things. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you know it, it's cyclical. Uh, I think that uh, this time around, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stick. Um, the models are, are going, are, you know, are, are evolving. Uh, the carriers want an operational model. Um, the enterprises are demanding solutions that they can deploy without any, anyone questioning their desires to fix, you know, their, their own problems. It may be fixing the carrier's problems too, but in a sense, it doesn't matter. It's got to be solved. And so, um, you know, and of course, you know, the technology uh, is, is really uh, slowly coming of age. Uh, not just, uh, you know, the radios or DAS per se, which is nothing more than RF distribution, but also the core networks are evolving to be able to uh, accommodate this change. So th that's what I see happening, and that's what's been going on for, for quite some time. You want to take 30 seconds, introduce Solid? Uh, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I was just <laughs> answering the question. So Solid, uh, uh, Solid is a manufacturer of uh, in-building and outdoor DAS. Uh, as well as a variety of in-building uh, coverage solutions and optical transport uh, solutions. And, um, and we're focused on solving for what we call the middle prize opportunity for in-building. And uh, it's really the core focus of most of our business right now. Okay. Bob? Yeah, Bob Butchko here. I work for um, Whoop Wireless. We're a relatively newcomer uh, to the DAS marketplace. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. And um, we have uh, actually built from the ground up, and I want to thank Ken for bringing up the, the middle prize because he's been talking about the middle prize now for about three years. And we, uh, we recognize the needs there, and the needs are to provide a carrier grade, very high quality, uh, very powerful uh, uh, signal uh, in the building, but yet um, be very affordable. Uh, I've, I've probably visited 50 literally 50 uh, commercial real estate developers in the last several years, and uh, they all love the idea of <clears throat> providing cell phone coverage in their building, but when you tell them how much it costs, you know, they, uh, uh, th first of all, they, they kind of turn white, you know, then they kind of, they get that little giddy, you know, giggle about, I can't believe what I just heard, and they tell you to leave the room because you're wasting their time. So somehow, the, the ability to provide good quality uh, cell phone coverage and capacity in a building uh, for a lot less than what is uh, generally being charged today is uh, the purpose of, of Whoop Wireless. And um, so I think the, the biggest changes have been that in fact finally people are getting to the point where the enterprise really has emerged, okay, and people really are forced with paying for, the, for, these, for these services. And um, uh, that, that's been coming for quite some time, but I think it's a, it's a real reality today and uh, that everybody has to grapple with. 
Okay, Ish. <coughs> yes, uh, let me introduce myself first. My name's Ish, Ish Kandasamy. I work for Comscope, um, based out of Singapore, and it's just checking what time zone I'm in at the moment, <laughs> but I believe I'm in the US. Um, so I look after the building solutions group within Comscope. So we're, we're focused, I actually come from a slightly different angle compared to the rest of the um, panelists here. Um, I, so I look after, uh, we focus on enterprise <coughs> connectivity. So how, how do we connect customers within enterprises? And we look at wide spectrum, we look at wired and wireless connectivity, which I think when it comes to enterprise, enterprise building, is an interesting dynamic there. And I guess later we'll talk about uh, license versus unlicensed spectrum, Wi-Fi, etc. Um, Comscope is a is a is a significant player in the in the DAS market and also the small cell market, as you, as you I think as most of you will know. Uh, we're also a, a significant player in the in the wired market, in, uh, as I've said already, uh, wired and wireless markets. Um, we, my, my view on what's driving, which direction is the business going right now is, is, is really fundamental. We, we, we have to step back and look at uh, the need for connectivity. So a, as an individual, as a business in particular, if every business now needs to, needs to connect. So what we're seeing now are obviously enterprises um, realizing that they cannot afford to be without uh, connectivity and be that wired or wireless connectivity. Now, um, there is clearly a drive towards mobile connectivity and there's a lot of research out there which shows that um, this, this dynamic between carrier funded and enterprise funded connectivity is, is now very much moving from carrier funded towards enterprise funded. In fact, I think you'll, you'll see we, the, the data will clearly show that uh, whereas we perhaps have around 10 to 15 percent of carrier funded, um, oh, sorry, enterprise funded uh, um, investment taking place right now from a m mobility perspective in the building is going to, within the next three, four, five years, it will become greater than 50 percent. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's driving, a, driving um, uh, a different approach to connectivity in the building. Okay, great. Ronnie? Uh, I'm the guy hidden behind over here. <laughs> so um, my name is Ronnie Haraldsvik. I've uh, got 25 years of networking experience, the last 15 in, in RAN and in wireless, and the last eight in small cells, and also you know, pushing managed services, or MEC, as Ian likes to call it. Um, I, it says up there that I'm you know, with a consulting firm, but really I'm working for a company called Coda Cloud, which is... Uh, just about to sort of pop out of the cake and, and you know, talk more about what we're doing, which we're gonna do in next, next month. So the company I work for is actually Coda Cloud. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the biggest change that I've seen, um, you know, it's really the big transition from you know, CapEx to OpEx, and that's also in the enterprise. And you know, Ken talked about the middle price and, and, and so forth, and that they are really wanted to buy and, and own. Um, I've, we've seen that at the, at the high end, the bigger enterprises, but when it comes to the medium and small enterprises, you know, they very much want to transition towards anything as an OPEX service. So if they can get that, just like they get their existing applications and services today from a service provider or from a business partner, that is something that they're favoring so that they can focus on running their business. You know, after all, they're not IT experts or around, you know, license spectrum, even unlicensed spectrum. So that's probably the biggest uh, change I've seen. Now, the other thing that puzzled me when I was invited to come and speak on this panel by Sharp, and I think he was setting me up with Ian, is about a year ago or so, I wrote this uh, blog that became an article published in AGL. Uh, I think it abbreviated the original headline, which the original headline of the blog was, "Das as we know it is dead, and D-A-A-D stood for something which was then republished as, you know, DAS is dead. So I'm just here to set the record straight, Ken, DAS is not dead. Thank you. It was a famous blog, but the question is, are you going to be the one popping out the cake? Uh, I hope not. So, ah, I hope so. so. Yeah. <laughs> I got to tell you, we, uh, I met with Ronnie this morning, we were sitting chatting, and uh, he, he had a meeting with a PR agency, and 
<laughs> he's like, don't you just love it when the PR agency tells you a minute before that they push the meeting back 30 minutes? I was like, really? What do you, you know, what do you do with the PR agency these days? This afternoon, we both met with the PR agency you've been talking to, and he walks up and he says, oh, Ian asked me this morning what good is a PR agency? <laughs> and I, of course, said, well, he's the one who said, don't you just love it when they kept pushing the meeting back by 30 minutes? So <laughs> we have that type of relationship. So, um, all right, so first question. Actually, a couple of you uh, mentioned Wi-Fi. So let's, let's start with Wi-Fi. And um, actually, Ronnie, we'll start with you and go back down that way. Nidish. What role does Wi-Fi play here? Uh, in the indoor small cell network? Is it, is it complementary? Is it, uh, yeah, how does it fit in here, what we're talking about? You know, I very publicly took, uh, took a, a mark against, you know, labeling Wi-Fi as a small cell, you know, several years ago, especially because all the work being done in small cell form and also separating that from a, you know, a radio head. But having said that, I mean, you know, enterprises are most focused on just, you know, making things work and making things work for them in their business. And they have a desperate need for license spectrum to work inside a building. They also have a desperate need to have Wi-Fi work inside a building. How that gets delivered is almost irrelevant. You know, as long as it adheres to the corporate policies for the large enterprise, they want to manage their own Wi-Fi. But for SMBs, medium enterprises, they just want license on license to work. And they're happy to actually take a combo solution, i.e., you know, Wi-Fi and license spectrum, whether that's a 3.5 in the neutral host band or you know, some of the license bands along with Wi-Fi. So it's, um, the answer, in pragmatic, pragmatically to me, is always going to be all of the above. DAS, Wi-Fi, small cell. OK. Ish, you mentioned, uh, yep. No, I, I, I fully agree with, with Ronnie there. Um, and in fact, when you look at the, the stats, when you, uh, when in terms of uh, wireless connectivity in a, in a building, it's, it's quite astounding how powerful, how, how dominant Wi-Fi is in, in, in the enterprise building. 72% is of connect, wi uh, wireless connections in a building are, are Wi-Fi. And, and if you project that out maybe to, from, 20, from now to 2020, you're looking at, and it's not gonna be a significant deterioration in that number, you're still looking at 64%, so around 60% of, of wireless connections being uh, Wi-Fi based. Um, small cell and DAS, uh, they, will, they will grow, but I think the big elephant in the room there is Wi-Fi, frankly. Right. And, but I, I agree, as I said, I agree with, with Ronnie, it is all about uh, the customer, the end user, really doesn't care how he's connected. He just wants right. to make sure he is connected with a reliable signal. Bob, how does Wi-Fi play into your uh, into Whoop? Well, you know, if you if you'd have asked me that question five or six years ago, I would have, I would have told you this: the, what we had just discussed that Wi-Fi was basically dead. You know that in fact, um, I couldn't see it. I just couldn't see it going as far as it has. But in fact, it has become very significant, and uh, the uh, Wi-Fi technologies, the boxes and so forth that are made today, are much more sophisticated, very sophisticated. And it really, because uh, I deal a lot with basically at the, at the uh, ground level with commercial developers and, and people that um, provide low voltage solutions and systems, systems in buildings and really at a practical level. And the Wi-Fi, I've been saying that the DAS uh, it should be or is a base, base, what they call a base building component for a long time. Well, it's not a base building component, really. Uh, what is a base building component, though, is Wi-Fi. You know, tell me a building that you know a building that's being built today that 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 Wi-Fi is not part uh, and a part that will be funded. So many times, the developers will perhaps put a DAS in in the beginning of the project, and then once they find out how much it costs and so forth, it slowly sinks down to the bottom of the list, and, it, and, it, and a lot of times it doesn't get put in. But I haven't seen Wi-Fi in that, in that position in the last couple of years ever happen, okay? Wi-Fi is just a must. So there's no reason technologically why Wi-Fi and cellular and so forth can't, cannot uh, coexist and bring a much broader and better solution to the uh, uh, experience, rather, to the customer you know, over, over time. I still believe that uh, the LTE uh, tech, uh, architecture and technology is, is, is vastly superior to anything that's out there now. We're only at the very start of taking advantage of it as time goes on. 
And, the, and the, the bottom line, which will never change in relationship to Wi-Fi, is the fact that, or at least I don't think it will ever change, is the fact that you are on a secure network, that you're on a network that is, you know, I was talking to somebody today and I said the difference between Wi-Fi and, and as far as being secure and stuff like that, it's like selling, bond, selling bonds. I like to sell you a bond from Afghanistan or I like to sell you a bond backed by the U.S. government. Which one are you going to take? Well. You know it, and, that, that, and, that, and that's what the carriers provide, is that security and level of serviceability and, um, and, and guarantee, essentially, uh, of, a, of, a, uh, of a dial tone, is what it really boils down to. So I think they'll both coincide, but I think Wi-Fi's come a long way. Okay. So Ken, you've done a few DAS installations? <laughs> yeah, just a few. Um, so, you know, obviously, I, I agree with these guys, right? I mean, Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi offloading is, is you know, I mean, it's, it works. Uh, with that being said, uh, the carriers, you know, still prefer their license bands. Uh, they're very territorial, as we know. So, I mean, you know, that's, it's not going away. Um, to me, um, it's part of the toolkit which is pretty much what the guys are saying too. It's like, look, all these things play in a toolkit, depending on the application or the project, you, you, know, do you, you need to incorporate one or all those things, right? To me, um, our current uh, shared Wi-Fi model is kind of a precursor to uh, you know, 5G shared uh, spectrum, or like 3.5 gig shared spectrum. Um, if, if they're willing to share uh, at, those, at those bands, it kind of hopefully sets the, the tone for the future frequency bands that, that can be shared and dedicated for, let's say, in-buildings capability. So, um, but, you know, a, a, absolutely, the, the Wi-Fi is going to continue to mature. All these shared access solutions are going to be able to mature as well, and right. they work, right? And it really comes down to the needs of that, of the end customer, mm -hmm. and what they need to deploy. There's a lot of customers that are going to say, you know what, we use Wi-Fi, but guess what? I don't want carrier grade stuff running across those bands because we need it, like a hospital. Hospital doesn't want that running on their network. It's not going to happen. So guess what? They want license bands to work. Um, they would prefer not to deploy too much garbage in their ceilings. So that's where the technology needs to be simplified and improved, right? Okay. So we did a we did an empl employee survey last year. Um, it's interesting. Talk to the employees, not the IT guy. And. Uh, uh, a lot of people want LTE at their desktop where there's, they're using a laptop with Wi-Fi because the company blocks uh, content on the Wi-Fi, like Facebook, for example. Also, nanny cams were the, one of the biggest uses mm -hmm. because the, the firewall would block a nanny cam mm. and they want to sit there with, it, so sit there with the phone on LTE indoors. Um, it was interesting. And then the other thing was purely having access to your own network. So doing banking was another big one where they didn't want the company knowing what they were doing. You know, it's almost like that don't trust the big brother in the company on the Wi-Fi, do it on LTE because then you know it's secure, which is uh, your point as well. So it's interesting. Um, of course, then there's my kids who, for them, Wi-Fi and LTE are completely interchangeable. And one's slow, dad, it's too slow, use LTE, don't worry about 30 gigs a month. You know, Dad will pay for that. Yeah. We're creating monsters here, which you guys are going to love, because all those networks are going to support them. Uh, any questions? Tom Wheeler, $10 check in the mail to anybody who asks a question. Wow. Well, as, as we wait for that question, I think it's actually important to keep in mind that mindset. Get $10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do I get 10 bucks? <laughs> um, it's important to keep in mind, uh, in mind that mindset that just, just make it work. I mean, yes, we may be talking about our kids right now, but, you know, that is the general you know, sense from, you know, employees in uh, any SMB or even in the large enterprise. You know, if you put too many restrictions around them, around them, they will find a way to connect to whether it's a Dropbox or, you know, Nanny Cam or something like that. Right. But, you know, what we need to do is focus on enabling a good service experience. And, um, you know, that's why we can't have these, you know, type of restrictions or sort of, uh, you know, industry battles, Wi-Fi against small cells, or small cells against DAS, anything like that, because it just needs to work together. All right, so we've talked about carrier funding. We've talked about enterprise funding. There's also a few companies out there doing third neutral party, third, uh, third party neutral host type solutions. Whose phone is that? Not me. It's that bag. That's an interesting ringtone, there's a, though. There's a bag ringtone over here. It sounds it's, like it's from Singapore. You mean there's Singapore? coverage in here? Huh? <laughs> 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 sound, it does sound like an ice cream truck. Is it yours, Rich? <laughs> 
Um, all right, so neutral host third parties, there's companies out there who are basically doing deals with the building owners, then getting agreements from the carriers. They're almost, it almost looks like a, a tower company inside the building, right? Um, how, do you see that taking off? Is it a, a you know, is it a viable model, or are we going to be in the role where we're always going to have to have the enterprise fund this or the carrier fund it? Do you want to start, Ken? Sure. I mean, the, uh, the third, I call them the 3PO's or the third party owners, right? And uh, ultimately, that model has been maturing for years now. And, uh, uh, you know, it started actually, a lot of it started in Vegas. A lot of these big uh, hotel casino uh, campuses. Um, you know, were, were basically the, some of the first neutral host or third, the back then third party owned projects. And it just made the, you know, the casino, those the hotels they don't want to touch it. They don't want to own it. They don't want to know it. They don't want to talk to carriers. They just want it to be happening. Right. So that's what um, a lot of building owners do want. They want someone else to deal with it. And if they don't have to pay for it, well, that's good too, right? But someone does have to pay for it, which means the model uh, has to, um, the models have had to mature to accommodate uh, the needs of the, of the operators um, better, right? Lower the cost, better service, you know, access. Um, so I, I see that uh, I see that continuing to the extent that there's a, a lot of projects uh, globally uh, that we see this happening in Europe too, for example, where um, there's a lot of high-profile projects and the owner building owners just don't want to want to deal with it. And so the third-party owners really fill that gap, and they also fill that gap for the carriers because the carriers don't want to deal with it as much anymore either. They don't want to pay either, but unfortunately, you know, they'll do it if <laughs> they got to get it done. So, you know, no, I see it continuing, and uh, I, I think their models have matured, and they're actually getting, they're expanding. They're, they're including the Wi-Fi, right, as part of their model. They're doing advertising. Uh, they have uh, public safety, which is very, very important and part of the model. Building owners need to solve for public safety. They need to solve for Wi-Fi. And in the future, they're going to need to solve for high-capacity 5G hotspots and all kinds of other things. So they need a provider to do that. And to the extent that they, they, so they don't want to own it and deal with it, a third-party owner really fills that gap really right. well. Okay. Anybody else? Bob? Yeah, I think, the, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, the carriers... Uh, think that the three POs are uh, just sort of expensive middlemen in a lot of ways. Uh, but, as it, as it, but as it turns out, I think you need those middlemen over, over a long period of time. And as Ken said, their, their role is changing. I think, and you can tell me you know, if I'm right or wrong because you're the, you're the research person, I think there's a lot more three PO companies today than there was five years ago. A, a more lot than there were two years ago. Oh, a yeah. lot more. Yeah. Okay, so so I think that's the answer to the to the question. Really, people wouldn't be getting into this business if it wasn't uh, very profitable and there wasn't a demand for it. So I think things are evolving over time. They will, uh, 3PLs will take over more of the uh, inbuilt, more of the wireless communications and inbuilding um, uh, communications uh, work. Uh, and the model will change so that it's more participatory to where you have the enterprise actually paying for, for, for some of these things and long-term loans and, and lots of different financial, uh, lots of financial models, you know, that, that will be applied here. So I think the model is around, is, is here to stay, and I think it's, uh, it's just evolving and there's more people getting into it every, you know, every day. Right. Ish, do you see the same model Asia-Pacific? Is it a... Uh, Ken mentioned North America and uh, Europe. Do you see the same? I mean, Asia Pacific is a large region, so I think there's certain yeah. countries within that where, where the model, the model does work. It doesn't work in some of the, some perhaps the two biggest countries there, um, China and India. But, but in general, I think the, what I, what I call the neutral host model, it, there's always going to be a, a room for that in, in in the enterprise, but uh, when we start looking, dissecting down and start analyzing uh, enterprise funded um, opportunity, I think it's going to get a little bit tougher for the neutral host to, mm -hmm. to make money mm -hmm. in that well, yeah, and it, But it does bring up a very interesting you know, question, actually maybe even a dilemma, which is you know, if, if you fast forward a couple of years and we have more devices with three, five radios in them and so forth, and the enterprise has become educated about the fact that this is a possibility, or any also building owners become more aware of the fact that this is actually a solution for fixing in building coverage and capacity in a neutral hose way, then 
you know, what happens to traditional DAS? Yeah. So I mean, and uh, my 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 view is there that uh, I think for the neutral host to 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 play a bigger role in the enterprise funded space, I think I think it's going to have to it, they have to cover more. The, the spectrum needs to open up. It's not just about, frankly, about wireless. Mm -hmm. Connectivity they'll necessarily, they're, 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 and there's no reason why they can't. So I think somebody mentioned earlier, it's this balance between capex and opex as well, right? Yeah. So it, neutral host it helps the end user to to take a more opex uh, approach to this, but but I think fundamentally it's still a still a challenge in the smaller enterprises, medium sized enterprises for the neutral host model to work financially. Right. But, but I do think that it, it does actually open up more opportunities for yourself too, you know, your Correct. companies, because whereas before the buyer, the who pays, was going to be the building owner or the system integrator, uh, either to differentiate a building and you know make it more attractive to tenants, or you have an existing building that just has you know problems and it's too costly to maybe fix it or they can't agree on who's going to pay for it. It does allow you to go to maybe, you know, the, the, the Goldman Sachs that has, you know, three floors on the 36th through 39th floor to pay for it because it solves yeah. the problem for them. So it was a leading question. It's a friend of mine actually started a company as a 3PO, and uh, you know, it's taken a struggle. You know, you got everybody aligned between the building guys, the carriers, and the financing, and all the rest. Um, but what I find interesting is that uh, there are carriers out there that have built their brand on best network. Right? We all know who they are, and yet they will out, they're effectively outsourcing the, the building of an in-building network. It's an OPEX-driven model, handing it off completely. You know, go build this, run it for me. And the same carrier has actually come back and said, by the way, can you give me some space in your data center? To your point, Ish, about it, it's more than that. It's, yeah. it's uh, to do other things as well. So. It, you can see the carriers starting to move into where the third party is doing more and more, and eventually they'll get to the point where I think where the outdoor looks like that as well. So, but yeah. uh, we're a ways off of that. But, you, right. but you, have yeah. some, you have some actually interesting things going on quiet, quietly in the industry where you have formerly you know, system integrators or companies that you know, maybe were just installing in building systems, whether it was DAS or small cells. You know, they, they see the bigger opportunity, they're adding a knock, they see the 3.5 coming, understanding that being a neutral host, it's actually gonna put them in more into the power play game. Mm -hmm. And it's not just gonna be, you know, Google as a potential emerging player, there's gonna be other, these other, you know, pseudo tower slash system integrator companies that have building out their knock in their cloud, realizing that they can just not just toss in 3.5 and do the existing DAS business, they can maybe even toss in Wi-Fi too, and boom, they're in service, yep. you know? Yeah. Right. Good. Any questions? Wow. Late in. The, yes. Um, uh, rec most uh, recent um, two two recent acquisitions. Obviously, we bought uh, Irvana, which is a small yeah, cell, and, and, uh, and T's mobility business. To, uh, Correct. A fem a f it's a femto cell type approach. Um, at a high level, I will, I can. Uh, so, you know, and it's, it's this basic fundamental stuff here that uh, you know we see small cell as starting to dominate in the in the enterprise funded model. Okay, because it's literally all to do with the commercial aspects there. Um, the CAGA or the growth rates associated with small cell versus DAS, it's, it's significantly higher for small cell versus DAS. So for, an ex for example, in the US, uh, we've looked at the data, it, it, it shows that um, currently small cell in the enterprise accounts for about 15, 20% of the, 
of the bill, uh, roughly, uh, very rough numbers, 10, 10 to 15 percent. In four years' time, um, you're going to have enterprise-funded small cell technology being uh, installed, or, uh, installed. It's going to take perhaps around 40, 50 percent of the market in the enterprise. So it's growing much faster than traditional DAS. Um, so it's important for companies like ourselves to have um, a, f a finger in that pie, let's put it that way, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, and back to, as I said, the fundamental is that uh, small cell technology by and large, although obviously it offers different performance characteristics compared to, to high powered ass in particular, um, it does offer commercial advantages. Um, it is simpler to deploy as well. That's an important element here. Small cell typically runs off the uh, typical LAN cable technology, so the, the cost of installation, which is not insignificant, is, 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 is significantly reduced when it comes to small cell deployment. So uh, that's, another, that's another reason why we think, we believe small cell will start to dominate in this mid to smaller enterprise. So uh, I had a similar question actually to Sharps on my, on my list yeah. here, is what, what is it you guys are putting in today and where do you see this going? Because we used to put in these DAS systems with you know, the big radios and the, the attenuation board and then you had all the, you know, the nodes out there, right? And then we put in a small cell that goes feeds straight into the antenna array now we've got small cells sitting in different size buildings and we've got super femto cells. So, uh, Ken, we'll start with you and then uh, Bob. What is it you put in, you know, I come to you today, I'm an enterprise. What are you putting in? What goes in there? Well, we still predominantly, you know, we're still deploying 98% uh, standard uh, fiber coax DAS. Um, that trend is starting to change as new, new solutions that we roll out and others roll out are starting to change that paradigm. However, uh, the fact is this, um, neither an active RF solution or a small cell solution for a multi-operator middle price project, uh, active solutions cost more. They're right now currently not a reality to, you know, to deploy for, for the average middle price customer. Um, that, that is the nirvana. We'd like to get to something that uses a cat cable or a fiber cable so that you don't have to deploy half inch coax. We all like that for the RF. And we'd like something that you plug in a backhaul to the front end and you're done and you don't have to go call everyone, right? And so that, that's the nirvana situation. Um, you know, the average uh, middle price customer um, doesn't want to have to go around and get different, middle, different products from different people, right? It needs to be a one solution. And that's really, you know, that all, that hasn't boiled to the surface yet. I think we all, uh, we dream about that. A lot of the guys on this stage dream about the solutions that, that make that all easier and simplified. Um, and it is coming. Active stuff on the ceiling um, is still problematic from a cost perspective and uh, a failure perspective. When it breaks, you got to go on a ladder. Um, DAS, even though it's the dumb pipe, <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, it's still very broadband and it does it. Is it 5G proof? No. <laughs> um, but there's gonna be a migration and all the technology will evolve and it will start to, to migrate. So we, we're, we're talking to customers about, well, look, coax still works right now. How do you, oh, you want a future proof for 5G? Okay, well then put a lot of fiber and other cables in your ceilings and create lots of hot, what we call hotspot points where in the future, if you need to add electronics, you're gonna be able to do that. It's the only way to, to future-proof those projects. Um, but there's no design methodology yet, right? We don't know, you know if it's going to be which frequency we think we're going to need or how much backhaul, which is why fiber would be great. <laughs> you know. But you need some copper, too, because you got to power stuff. So that's right. currently the only answer to that. But, but what we do today, uh, currently solid, is doing 98% um, uh, coax uh, and, fiber desk. And do you find that enterprises will invest in the fiber to future-proof themselves? Um, they're, they're listening. They're starting to modify the designs. And, uh, you know, the problem is, well, when you're designing things, where do you put it, right? right. And, you know, it's split the difference. <laughs> Create some points in the ceiling, roll that stuff up, and have it there for the future. If you don't do any, you, you got nothing to go with, yeah. right? Um, really, the, the limitation right now for the middle prize uh, isn't that so much that they hate coax. 
technology geeks like would like to replace coax because you know unless you're a hardcore rf guy <laughs> but um we would like to replace it because we know it's a an installation cost uh, like ish mentioned uh and it's it's kind of a ugly thing for most enterprises right um however what is the problem is is solving for the mo uh, the, the carrier's connection to the core and solving for the ownership that that front end of the system complete solution that's the biggest limitation for the middle price it's not the coax cable because uh, you know the coax and fiber the das systems that are out there they are of distribution systems just say that no matter what kind it is yep. they're perfected we, they're awesome they do a lot of great there's a lot of great solutions out there it just distributes rf guys and it's broadband that's all it does so it works so to the extent you can replace that with a radio on the ceiling that's great but it better do everything it needs to do and it doesn't do that yet so right. bob what are you guys putting in well <clears throat> i um I think that uh, Ken, um, Ken's Nirvana is uh, my company's product, and and, and, I, and I'm not and I'm not, I'm not I, there's only there's only you know I'm just dealing with the facts here. I'm not, I'm not trying to sell anybody anything, but just, but the ability that uh, our, let me explain our product just a little bit to you, and I think it, it fits very well with what you're saying because I think that's exactly what the marketplace needs. Fundamentally, we have an intelligent, active, distributed antenna system that we can put into a building all in turnkey for less than a dollar, less than a dollar a foot. It is a, it's active in the fact that the, at, the, at the head end, we communicate with each one of the antennas. Each, each one of the antennas has its own, uh, its own uh, um, amplifier, its own mini amplifier, micro amplifier. So in fact, what we can do with using TV cable, okay, RG11, regular old TV cable, we put a little bit of RF from the head end out to the first node or out to the first antenna, and in fact, we don't need to blast a lot of RF out there because we know that when it gets to the first antenna, it is, it's, it's amp amplified again. And then we go to the second one and the third one, and, and, and as, as far as you can see, fundamentally, we can have a consistent... Um, uh, are a consistent, effective radiating power out of each one of the antennas. Each one's active and each one's intelligent. So they all can see each other. The head end can see them all. And we can, we can literally reprogram the head end for whatever, we, whatever purpose, turning things off, turning things off, attenuation on the uplink and on the downlink uh, remotely. And that all comes in a cigar box size uh, head end and the little amplifiers are about that big and they're all attached to the antennas. So we have a very, noise, very low noise level situation, consistent, powerful, uh, effective radiating power, and we can do it either off air or more importantly, we can do it today using a small cell. We can attach in there. And so I think that's, I think that the, the, the real answer here is not exclusively a small cell, or it's not exclusively a DAS. I think it is a DAS that's fed by a small cell, mm -hmm. and 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 do it and and, uh, and do it in our way, which is to actively uh, uh, amplify the signal at each one of the antennas, so you don't have to have a lot of horsepower going out into the system. There were some big cigars you're smoking there. Yeah. 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 Groucho Mark Central. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Any questions? I've got two more for them. Yes. One back. So, yeah. so single carrier is limitation today for the carrier yeah. yes. for a small cell. Yes, right. so I'll make it too. I'll make your expand your question a little bit. I'll uh, I'll be happy to address that. The the answer to that is actually no. Um, it's not a limitation anymore. You do actually have uh, whether it's in the same chassis or adjacent cells. You have the ability to use the two, sometimes even three carriers. Uh, all depends, you know, how it gets deployed. Yeah, at the same time, we as the industry always make the wrong assumption in assuming that everywhere in the US you want to have four carriers. It's not the case. You know, for the most part, any enterprise, whether it's a medium or large or even if they're small, you'll find out that you're gonna have two predominant you know major carriers that you know your employees you know use. So with that, small cells having two carrier solutions today and there are companies out there that have it, yeah. you know, Spider Cloud included, can do that. Yeah. Uh, I just got cut off, I'm not sure. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, um, so absolutely, technically, uh, there is a capability to, capability to add multi-carrier support through, through, with small, via small cell technology. I, I think the key there, though, is uh, the, the commercial advantage I talked about previously comes when it's a single carrier with, right. with small cell. When you start adding multi-carrier support, your the cost advantage of small cell starts to deteriorate. But uh, I think one basic thought here, and, and some, just add to something that was mentioned earlier, um, I think when it comes to the enterprise, the, every enterprise wants to have just one common infrastructure in place. So the infrastructure that dominates at the moment is, is, a, is an IP-based infrastructure, which typically is a, is a mix of copper and fiber. Mm -hmm. right? You have a fiber backbone and a, and, a, and, a, and a copper horizontal layer. And so, the, so if we can get, and I think that's the way, it, well, for the, we, for the foreseeable future anyway, that's the way it's going to go. It's, it's going to be prim, primarily a copper-based infrastructure of which they want to be able to feed the, the, their RF signals or control the RF signals. Um, I, the other key point, someone mentioned it earlier, is that when you have such an, an IP-based infrastructure in place, it's, 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 it's well known, it's accepted compared to a coax, typically compared to a coax infrastructure. It can also power, you know, certainly obviously over copper, it can also power devices. So when you think, we talk about what's the future hold for, from an enterprise perspective, these buildings are going to be um, sensor rich. Right, you know, IoT is a is a dominant is a is a it's a common term at the moment, and uh, so what that basically means is you're going to have a lot of different types of sensors in place. How do you power? How do you control and connect these sensors? So that's another dynamic that plays into what we're trying to achieve from a mobility perspective. Just just to add on to the, the question that you asked, I mean, very often it comes down to who pays, you know. Correct. So and it, you know, Ken yeah. mentioned this and uh, Espan too, um, you know, but if uh, if you really want to speed up the deployment of inbuilding solutions, you know, you know, if you make it look like Wi-Fi, smell like Wi-Fi, install like Wi-Fi, i.e., over Ethernet, okay. it's just going to be a lot easier to also have the enterprises bear the cost burden of getting it in. And if that's the case, they sometimes or very often will ask for a multi-carrier solution, which is feasible. Okay, um, I've got one kind of quick. Qu any other questions, by the way? I very much, for the record, believe in small cells as a service. Um, it would help expedite the deployment of small cells on behalf of mobile operators who are paying for it, or even in a case of enterprises that don't have the expertise to, to manage or install it themselves, but would like to just get an in-building fix going. So yes. There you go. Okay, so I've got uh, two questions left, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, and. I'm good, I'm good, okay. Well, this might take a while, so. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go down, Ken, Bob down with that way. Um, you guys all talk to enterprises. You all start the conversation with an enterprise and you end up building them something in their DAS, small cells, et cetera, et cetera. How does the conversation start? Does it start with, I need coverage? Does it start with, I need capacity? It, does it start with, I've got complaining employees? Does it start with, I've got so much money, help me? Where does the conversation start these days? What's, what's kicking it off? Well, I mean, it's always, it's very common, right? We're all humans. We look at our device and we go, it's not, Facebook's not connected. I'm not happy. I mean, it's, it's that simple, right? Um, it really does depend on the, 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 the project type, right? So we do a lot of uh, uh, higher ed universities. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, the, uh, you know, the, uh, um, the board, uh, the boards of those uh, universities are like, hey, it's got to work. This is ridiculous. You know, our students can't communicate. Uh, they, they, you know, their parents spend sixty grand a year, and I can't even call my kid in the dorm. Right? You know, oh, there's Wi-Fi calling. Oh, well, there's too many people streaming stuff. Right? So that's not working. Right? I mean, I got two in college, and that's exactly what I'm dealing with. Right? You know, and I'm like, who, who, where's the DAS? You know, <laughs> we can help you. But um, you know, it's. Um, uh, uh, it, it really depends on 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 the project uh, type, um, but but it always starts with the, the with the complaining, no doubt. Uh, it, it, when it's 
it's the pain. Uh, it's also the revenue loss, right? Um, you know, people don't, they, they're really sensitive when this stuff doesn't work. And uh, uh, in a public venue application, so stadiums are the big high profile ones, right? Uh, it's expected. It's actually part of the NFL, for example, with the NFL, it's part of their requirements now. MLB, same thing, that they, there's a certain level of uh, cellular service, 4G, 3G, 4G service that has to be provided at a, at the, at a game or you are not one of them, you know? Right. And so those are the kind of things that, that are happening. Um, you know, and there's a lot of conversations that start out with public safety, uh, first responder, right? There's a lot of discussions about first net. There's a lot of new codes being written. Um, you know, that happens, uh, you know, that's happening more and more, right? Um, and then, the, so it starts out as, I need to meet code. And then they say, you know what? And my cell phones don't work. Can you do that too? And so there's a, there's a lot of different ways that these things happen. And, yeah. you know, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of customers that think Wi-Fi and cellular are like, you can fix them the same way. <laughs> to Ronnie's point, it's got to be like Wi-Fi, right? So the, the, the average um, enterprise customer sees it that way. They're just like, look, how do you fix that? Let's do that. And, and they don't understand. Public safety, same thing. Uh, what do you do? Oh, you put this thing in? Okay. And the fire department's happy? Good. Then we're all good, right? right. Which is why... The, the integration or the VAR community that, that installs and service and, and manages these, these systems is broadening their scope of services. They used to be just, oh, that's an RF guy does this and a public safety guy does this. And they're now, you know, mega integrators that are offering a variety of enterprise services from Wi-Fi to public safety to cellular 4G. And there's different levels of guys depending on the size of projects, right? Um, but that, the whole enterprise uh, middle price space is evolving and uh, with the technology and the people doing it. But you know, ultimately, like I said, it really does vary uh, depending on, on the project. The, the middle prize or the smaller projects, uh, it, it's typically, uh, it is typically, I need my, this to work because my employees are not happy. Right. And it is very, very, very common. Yep, okay. Anybody else, Tony? Well, I'm happy to add to that. I mean, it's, um, in my experience, and again, just my own personal experience, and I had the pleasure of running a, an enterprise advocacy council in the previous job that I was with, and uh, you know, we had 25 to 35 very active enterprise IT people that all were just focused on solving a business problem, which was we just want to do our business. And this magic stuff of RF and, and building coverage capacity, you know, frankly, it's the equivalent of, you know, I just want to get in my car and drive. Don't tell me after I bought the car, I had to buy an engine block and put it in and, you know, put in my own brake pads just to kind of make it go. They just want it to work. So, you know, the simpler we can make it for them, uh, the better. And that's why the more the transition from CapEx to OpEx is so important because it's pervasive across IT organizations. And I urge every one of us, especially that work in the mobile industries, to spend time with enterprises because they are the customers that are going to be paying our bills for many years to come. Mm -hmm. I know there's a, there's a lot of work going off um, with uh, commercial real estate agents because, you know, they, they grade Class A buildings. To, you get so many covered parking spaces. You get marble bathrooms and, you know, there's so many toilets per employee and all this type of thing. But yet, and there's, there's infrastructure in there. There's power and uh, Ethernet is one of the measurements. But nobody actually measures how good the uh, cellular signal is in the building. Don't even, I mean, they'll literally go, oh, look, 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 five bars. And there's a lot of work on right now to actually walk through buildings and actually do heat maps and show, hey, this is a good building. Therefore, you can get a few dollars extra per square foot because it's got, and make it that, because it is that important. It's like a parking space, right? It's like a marble bathroom. But you see so. this now actually in, in the hotels. I mean, we're on Yelp and uh, your yeah. star rating on Yelp is impacted by how good your cellular or Wi-Fi coverage right. is inside the hotel. I mean, they, that, that is an expected service now. Yep. All right. Yeah, just, a, just a quick point on, mm. on the general question, and, and it absolutely is about what you say depend, where you start depends on who you're speaking to. Right, in terms of vertical market, right? in terms of vertical market. So uh, um, obviously you talk to hotels, it's about coverage, uh, typically, right? Um, talk to a HQ of a, of a large building, it's a very different discussion. I, t I was speaking to a bank in Latin America, in Argentina a few couple of months ago. They were very clear. They said, we want, we want, our, we want a, a dedicated in-building coverage system, but we only wanted to carry one carrier because it, for security reasons. They wanted right. to absolutely control 
the, the connection. So yeah. for, in that particular case, small cell right. has a very large opportunity, yeah. but where typically DAS or high power, or maybe even low power DAS would have so would have been ideal. They were very clear. They would just want single, single, single carrier. Yep. So it's a use case discussion. Yep. Uh, Ken and then Bob. Yeah. One, one other thing I want to bring up on the enterprise too, is, and we're seeing this shift is um, so as the technology shifts, uh, where we can essentially provide a totally self-contained solution for all operators. Um, essentially, the enterprise and the integrator that puts that system together has to decide how much capacity is going to be needed for that facility and backhaul and everything else. So now since the carrier is not necessarily engineering all that, someone has to do that. Well, how do you, how do you determine that? All right, do you just ask the building owner, oh, how many people live here? You know, what kind of phones do they have? They don't know that information. You almost, that modeling that capacity is actually gonna become very critical. So for example, one of the things that we're, we were looking at doing on, on some projects is, is there a way we could actually just monitor all the operators in the building you know, uh, at all floors somehow, where we can say, all right, after a week of surveying it, there's this many of these users and it's about this much throughput and that way you can model it correctly, right? You don't want to put too much uh, rate resources into a facility and charge the enterprise for that, you know, when they don't really need it. And you all, furthermore, uh, you also want to be able to let them scale that, that capacity going forward. All the infrastructure is great, but if you don't, ha if you can't serve it properly, it's useless, right. and that's their biggest complaint with DAS, is how do you solve that front end? Well, it's someone else's, it's their problem. Well, how, what am I getting? I don't know, that you're not allowed to know that. You know? I mean, it's just, it's the, it's the single biggest you know, problem. Well, yeah, more and more in the, in the middle prize, in the 50 to 100,000, 150,000 square foot uh, office building, or maybe multifamily residential, or dormitories, for example, on campuses, uh, we're seeing that the the whole issue of capacity is is kind of a non-issue. People just want to be able to make a phone call because they have Wi-Fi in the building, right? The Wi-Fi has already been there. People can certainly browse and do whatever they want to do, stream video on the whole bit, but they want a less expensive system uh, that that it comes close to the Wi-Fi uh, uh, expense, and, that, and that's happening today. Wi-Fi's are getting a little bit more expensive. The DAZs are certainly coming down dramatically in cost. And really, the, the whole idea here, in so many instances, we did about 10, uh, we have lots more to go, but 10 uh, dormitories on a very large uh, Texas campus, and, and they're just desperate to get, a, to, get to make a phone call. The, the parents want to call the kids, the kids want to call, call, the, call the parents. And, I'm not um, sure about that. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe it's the reverse, you know, but fun, especially for life safety and stuff like that, they want to be able to make a phone call. And they basically just, uh, basically just accept or go right past the Wi-Fi scenario because they know they're going to have Wi-Fi in the building. So making a phone call is actually coming back. So just to let you know, we did a lot of work with millennials this summer. You may think you're talking to your millennial kid, but reality is they're treating you like a dinosaur because they're making phone calls to you and using texting. Right. To their friends, they are Snapchatting, group meing, Facebook is old. Kids actually select the communication tool based on the uh, target audience. So you think you're in really, you know, you're being hit because my kids are calling me on their cell phone. Yeah, trust me, they're Snapchatting everybody else all the time. So mm -hmm. I Snapchat. Sure. <laughs> all right. Two minutes left. No, we're done? We're good? Oh, but, but Ian, you just reminded me of a conversation we had on a panel two years ago um, yeah. where I you know, brought up the fact that you know, our kids will be doing FaceTiming most of the time, video. Yeah. Sure. And, um, you know, 90% of the conversations that my kids have are all video FaceTime. Yep. All right. Question 30 there. seconds. There's somebody that oh, there's a question? Oh, I'm sorry.
So this is, this is a question about the cost model of uh, de deploying small cells and DAS in the U.S. Yes. as opposed to uh, other places in the world? Yes, and certainly it's going to have regional sensitivity, right? right? So, so when we talk about hotels, these guys, they're going to have regional sensitivity. Right. That, that's why technology is technology through technology. We're just getting better and better at making these things less expensive, and that's and that has always been the that's always been the complaint. They want to have both uh, to make a phone call, but also to have you know um, uh, capacity uh, related uh, services also. But the the cost has been extraordinary, and uh, as time goes on, that those costs are coming down. Let's not forget that uh, all the great technology, uh, cloud, and, and different solutions, they can all come down in cost. Ultimately, uh, as an industry, we've been waiting for the core networks to shift as well, right? Uh, you know, the virtualization of the core, IP core, um, the opening up of those architectures um, is absolutely fundamental to lowering the costs in our industry, right? The more things are proprietary and closed, it, it's, it stifles innovation, and it's been that way since, you know, the original phone, right? So it's, it's uh, we, we're transitioning right now, and uh, those things are going to enable all kinds of new uh, architectures. And uh, so we're going to continue to push on that bleeding edge, and as far as, as the market can change, so the business models can change. But that will drive the cost down, and the technology will follow. Well, a dedicated frequency band is awesome, right? I mean, yeah. that, I mean that's, I mean that's, we'd all love that, right? Because now you don't have to deploy six bands, you know. Uh, but, but then you got to share, and people don't like to share, <laughs> so and, you got to solve that part. <laughs> and remember, we can't even get through 600 mega auctions. So, all right, 15 seconds each. Ronnie, you go first. Ish, Bob, Ken. What keeps you awake at night? Other thing we talked about, not kids and you know college payments and stuff. Uh, what what terrifies you that we're not talking about? We should be. We should be more cust customer focused, um, plain and simply. You know, we we make the mistake of you know making making statements and no pun intended here about you know we want to make just make a phone call when the uses of the network is doing everything else. Okay, good. Thirteen seconds, very good. Ish. Agree keeps with. Keeps you awake at night. Agree. It's it's about customer making sure the customer experience meets customer expectations. I think public security, public security um, is an issue as well when it comes to enterprise. Uh, I think okay. it's, okay. 16 seconds. Okay. Sorry. Little over there. Sorry. Bob, yeah. 15 seconds. I, I, think, think, I, I, I think there's only, only one thing for all of us to worry about and that is to how do we increase or how do we make better the customer experience and drive down the costs of providing that experience. 12 seconds. Okay, pressure's on, Ken. What keeps me awake at night? People hyping up 5G when we haven't even figured out how to deploy 4G <laughs> properly. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Oh, that was six seconds. You win. There we go. Yeah. That was it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>